Guys, welcome to the show. Today we're going to have a great episode with Greg Krogh of Mogollon Rim Outfitters. We're going to be talking rifle mule deer in Nevada. Before we get to that, I want to thank you guys specifically for your avid support of this podcast. Uh, without you guys, the loyalty that you guys show to this podcast, it wouldn't be possible. I just want to thank you. Also want to ask you, uh, which I hardly ever ask you guys to do anything, go on iTunes, uh, leave us a review, uh, leave us a rating. We appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, also, I want to thank the sponsors of this podcast. I want to thank Go Hunt Insider. I, got, I want to remind you guys during application uh, season to go to gohunt.com forward slash J Scott. You can also link it up here in the show notes. Uh, go to the link, uh, sign up for the Insider. It's the best Western hunting resource tool out there between uh, draw odds, harvest statistics, uh, strategy articles on what units to apply for. Uh, it's the best resource out there. You're going to get a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card just for signing up. Go check it out, gohunt.com forward slash J Scott. I also want to thank my friend Cody Nelson. Uh, he's the optics manager over there. If you guys have any binoculars, any optics needs at all, binoculars, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, uh, tripods, anything to do with glassing, you want to talk glassing, uh, Cody's the guy. Uh, give him a call at 702-847-8747. Uh, you can also, uh, that's extension two. You can also text him or call him on his cell phone, which is 602 399 3699. I'm constantly getting messages from listeners uh, who say Cody has given them the best customer service in the optics business they've ever seen. So reach out to Cody. Thanks for Go Hunt for their sponsorship. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting. Uh, you can go to kuyu.com. That's K U I U.com. Uh, to order. It's a direct-to-consumer uh, model, and they sell directly. They cut the middleman out, sell directly to uh, the consumer. It's the gear I've been using um, since 2010. It's uh, phenomenal gear. They continue to push uh, innovation and strive for the best products out there on the market. I also want to thank Phonescope.com. Use the JScott20 promo code. It's going to save you a 10%. Uh, go to phonescope.com, also onxmaps.com, the best uh, mapping resource. Uh, I use it for all my, all my hunts, my fishing trips, my real estate business, great private public land overlay, uh, great aerial, great topo. Uh, you can share waypoints just by simply texting it to your buddy. A phenomenal resource. Uh, go check out onxmaps.com. Use the JScott20 promo code, and you're going to save a 20% discount there on Onyx. So, guys, let's get right to this episode with Greg Krog, and we're right in the middle of application season. Arizona just hit credit cards. Uh, so to those of you out there that uh, drew an antelope or elk tag, congratulations. We've got several states to go here. So, um, yeah, best of luck to everyone out there. Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today I've got my friend Greg Krogh of Mogion Rim Outfitters. Greg's a little under the weather, got some coughing going on, but has agreed to come on the podcast to talk about this Nevada mule deer uh, outfitter pool uh, draw. Greg, how you doing? I'm doing good. How you doing, Jay? Good. I'm glad you're able to be with us today. And, um, you know, I guess before we get started and you can tell us how the outfitter uh, draw works um, with everything that we know. How does Nevada look as of right now, going into next season, for those guys that are looking at applying, whether they're applying in the outfitter pool or applying in the general draw? What are the conditions like? Well, we just got good rains last week, and there's supposed to be another good rain coming in tomorrow. And then I just looked on the forecast, and about a week out, it's showing for three days of rain. So Nevada's. The most critical really is April and May. You know, March, April, and May are the most so far. Um, if this one hits like it's supposed to right now, we should be pretty good. So coming off of a year last year, how would you say the antler growth uh, was in the state of Nevada, and how will that play a role in this year's hunts? Well, you know, last year was one of the best antler growths I've seen over there in a long time. Um, it was just the perfect storm of weather. We had really good antler growth. Um, overall, though, a lot of deer made it through. You know, um, it wasn't as banner of a year as everybody. You know, I don't. I don't think as far as harvest from what I was expecting it to be. Antler growth was really good, though. Um, I think last year was probably one of our 
or not probably it was definitely our best year we've ever had so and a lot of that was um you know, a lot of that was attributed to the rain. We had really good antler growth. Our average was probably up by 10 inches over normal. So when you say best year you've growth. had, you're talking about overall buck shot. It's the best year of performance of size that you guys have had. Yes, I would, for sure. It was probably 10 inches better than our average and three or four inches better than any year we've ever had before. What do you, I mean, other than just good antler growth, I mean, is, is, can you attribute some of that to... You know, just everything clicking on all cylinders, you know, guides really know. I mean, I know you guys know your stuff, but, I mean, is there anything other than just great antler growth that you can really attribute that to? You know, I, I would, I mean, antler growth obviously helped, but as far as getting the bucks down last year, we just, we, it just seemed like everything went really well. And, you know, it was funny because it started off so bad. You know, last year, I believe in August, um, we were, I think last year we went 0 for 4 on our archery hunts, and it was probably four of the best archery hunts I feel like we've ever put on. We just could not get a break, and us, you know, we're starting to feel like this it couldn't work out, you know. And uh, and so I think by the time the archery season ended, we had gone 0 for 4. Um, we were all hunting giant bucks, though, just weren't getting them killed. We had a few missed shots, and then we also had um, just some missed opportunities, kind of fluky things. We had a really big buck that got away from us twice because of a mountain lion. Just seemed like nothing was going right. And then all of a sudden, right around the, the muzzleloader hunt, it just all started to come together. And all those bucks that we didn't get on the archery hunt, we ended up getting on the rifle hunts and the muzzy hunts. So we ended up getting all of them except for one, I believe. Um, there were five bucks we were hunting. I think we ended up killing four of those on the rifle and muzzleloader hunts. One of them got away. Um, that, you know, of, of the top ones we were hunting on the archery season. And then uh, after that, it just seemed like it, momentum picked up and it just started rolling and, man, it just seemed like we caught every single break. I don't think we had, that I can remember, maybe one or two missed shots, which is, you know, not normal. Um, and just seemed like everybody was connecting on everything that we were finding and, man, just everything was really working out. Caught a lot of breaks. So with that being said, but you also feel like you've got a lot of holdover bucks, is that just because the antler growth was so good that those, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten tier bucks, you know, when you're kind of, I'm sure you have a hit list. I mean, are you feeling like, you know, there's a lot of holdovers because the 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 bucks that you didn't shoot are still really good bucks or, or you know, there's a lot of backup bucks? Talk about that. Yeah, you know, it was funny. Usually the the bigger bucks we kill normally are all bucks we've known about and maybe watched either for several years or, you know, for sure that year leading into it. But last year, it was kind of crazy. A lot of, when we shot five bucks that we knew about that we've been following regularly, five or six, but we also had nine or ten really big bucks that we killed that we'd never seen before, you know, that just kind of you know, uh, either migrated in late in the season that we didn't know about that came from other areas. And those are kind of almost like freebies because they're not taking out the inventory of the deer we already know about. Does that make sense? Yeah, for and sure. So that's why I'm I'm really confident about next year because we still had a lot of deer that we know about that we didn't hunt last year. You know, it was such a good antler growth year. We were able to really focus on the high end stuff. And there were a lot of really good up and comer bucks last year that we didn't take or, you know, even went after. So I think if we have another good wet spring, it could be another really good antler growth year. That's awesome. So with everything that you know it as of right now, you're saying you're thinking it's going to be great. Obviously, you can't predict what happens. You know, we're, we're here in February. You can't predict March, April, May. You can look at forecasts and kind of the way things have been going. But, I mean, if it just turned average from here on out, would you say it's, you know, going to be another great banner year? I think so because it's always been my belief that a mild winter that isn't super cold, that it, you and I have talked about this before, that the best recipe is kind of a mild winter um, with uh, not really super cold conditions where the deer come out of it in good shape. And then March, April, uh, you know, late March, April, and May when we get those rains, then they do really well. Obviously, if you have that and then you don't get those rains, it can be a disaster because then you don't even have the moisture from the winter. So winter moisture is down a little bit, but that's also been the case in a lot of our really good years. The important part is starting about now forward. And like I said, in the 10-day forecast, it's looking really good. We gotten, I think there's four of the next 10 days that's calling for good rain out there. Yeah. So is Nevada different from Arizona in any way as far as, 
you know, trying to judge that antler growth and, um, you know, as far as growing periods, is everything pretty much right on track with, with Arizona um, compared, you know, or is it later? You, know, you mean as far as when it starts? I think it's a little bit, um, it's earlier than Arizona for sure. Um, you know, we, when we finish out, you know, we're already hunting these bucks by the 10th of August. And, you know, I, I think we're probably, I would say three to, I would guess three to four weeks. So maybe not so much like the strip, but like the rest of Arizona, I would say we're probably a month ahead of them. Okay. Our, even our, even our rut quite a bit earlier. You know, everything's about a month earlier, three weeks to a month earlier over there. So where we're at right now is this is not the general draw. This is the outsetter mule deer uh, pool. Uh, talk about, you know, our main focus of this podcast for this episode, and we've talked about it before, and for those listeners out there, go back and check out a couple of the, uh, I think we've done this two or three years. Talk about this outfitter draw, how it all works, and uh, just basically the scoop on it. Yeah, okay, so the outfitter draw, uh, the state of Nevada sets aside a certain number of non-resident tags in all the units, and they're set aside for only people applying with an outfitter. So each one of us outfitters has a password and a code, and, um, and what we do is we, we give that out to these people, and they can apply through us. Now, this is a special tag that's only valid when they go with an outfitter. So it does eliminate a lot of the people that are applying um, that are going to go do it on their own. So you're, you're basically competing against a smaller pool. So this tag, if drawn, is only good if you go with an outfitter, though. You know, you can't draw it in the outfitter pool and then do it on your own. So typically in the units that I'm hunting, it increases, like I'm basing it off of last year's totals, it, it increases it by anywhere from two times better to four times better, depending on the unit. Um, wow. So I do about five or six different units, and it's between two and four times better. And, you know, the odds aren't great, um, but, it's all, you know, no matter what they are, if they're twice as good, it's better, or four times as good. Sure. It's pretty low across the board. We are hunting the premium units. Um, most of the units we're hunting are anywhere from a 1% to a 20% draw. Tell us how it works from a, the time someone calls you on the phone. What do they need to do? How, how does your program work? So all they got to do is call me on the phone or email me or text me, any one of those things, and just all I need is their email address. Obviously, they're welcome to call and talk to me also, but once I get their email address, then I email them over uh, some explicit instructions. It breaks it down. There's a link on that email. They click on that link. takes them right to the page. They enter in my password and my code, and then they follow the instructions on the email. I send them on which units to apply for and what order. I give guys two different choices, a more aggressive approach um, where you're trying to get drawn, and then where I take a couple of those units off for a less aggressive approach for the guys that have a lot of points and and maybe that don't mind waiting a long, long time and just want to only hunt the top, you know, one or two units. You've told me before that um, Nevada, I believe, cubes squares the points. Um, correct me if I'm yes. wrong. But you also encourage, if you don't have points, to put in in this outfitter pool that you, you actually have taken people that have only applied for a year or two or three and don't have very many points. Yeah, and that's one of the things about Nevada is it's, you know, and um, it may change in the future, but as of right now, they don't set aside any points to the, t any tags to the top point holders. So, for example, if you've got, you know, you know one, two, three points, you know, obviously somebody that has 10 has more chances in the draw, but you do have a chance of drawing with nothing. Um, there has been multiple years where we've drawn the hardest tag with a guy with one or two points, you know, and he just beat the odds and did it. So anybody can draw it, and uh, you just start building points if you don't draw. Uh, I've put in with you before on this um, deal, and it is really easy. Just sent you an email, and, you, you know, you say, if you want to go aggressive, if you want to go, you know, swing for the fence, here's some units. Uh, and it's all self-explanatory. Now, you do have to buy a Nevada license. I know that because I've been getting things saying that the license is going to be renewed. Um, do you have to do it at the time of application, or do you have to do it before you actually you know, apply online? No, you can do it while you're applying. Okay. So if, it, if mine is set up for auto-renew, 
uh, would I go ahead and just click the box and buy the license when I apply, or should I let it renew and then and then do it? Um, you know, that's a really good question. I don't know on the auto renew how that works. Um, I would assume you know, if that's... you buy the license, it would kick off the auto renew. Yeah, I can't imagine they're going to send you two. Right. Um, but I can. What I can do is, man, I don't know how that's going to help you, but I can check on it and then and then. Uh, you know, whoever calls about it, I can have that answer, and I can put it in the email when I send them that stuff. Okay, perfect. So we've got a deadline of March 9th, I believe, and is that a 5 p.m., or is that a midnight, you know? It's 11 o'clock p.m. on March 9th. p.m. Okay, so, I mean, obviously we know how these computer systems works on, work on these states that, you know, you probably don't want to wait to the last day, um, but certainly... Between now, when this podcast airs, and the 9th, um, if anybody gets a hold of you and you basically send them the email, they'll be able to apply and, and get everything taken care of. Yep. That, it doesn't take very long. If You want to have at least two or three days if you're a first-time applicant and you were born after 60 because they do need a copy of your hunter safety, but there is a number it's on the instructions where you can fax in a copy of your hunter safety card, but it takes them a day or two to get that approved. Okay. So you definitely, if, if that's, you definitely want to get on it right away if it's somebody that's applying for the first time and, you know, to get their hunter safety card sent in. Let's talk about some of the units uh, that you guys hunt specifically um, and, and talk about, you know, with, with each unit as you kind of describe each unit. Describe kind of the terrain and the vegetation. Describe, you know, kind of the hunt dates and, you know, whether it's, you know, pre-rut, rut, you know, um, no rut, you know, yeah. and then talk about kind of the quality of bucks, you know, on average every year that, you know, are they, you know, 180 to 170 to 190 hunts, and then, you know, this specific hunt is, you know, maybe a chance at a 200, or, you know, this is the trophy hunt of all of Nevada that's, you know, you're expecting, a, you know, 185, 190 plus, you know, talk, talk like that so guys can get a ballpark. Yeah, so our, our our top choice is 241 to 245, and, you know, that's a, a unit with lower deer densities, but the biggest deer, in my opinion, in the state. Typically, most of the governor's tag bucks um, come out of that unit every year. Uh, last year, we took four people in that unit, and I, we shot a 239 buck, a uh, 210 buck, um, a 194 buck and a 182 buck. Um, with the last, actually, I think we did five. Um, I'm, I'm missing one there, but anyway, we 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 ended up. Oh, and we also shot a 180. I'm sorry, we we shot another 190 bucks. So we took five guys in that unit last year, and the bucks were be, like between 182 and the low end, and the highest was a 239. And um, that's typically our best unit every year. It's one I think is the best. A little bit lower numbers, a deer, but um, a lot older age class of deer in that unit. Um, our top, our second and third picks are two. Th by the way, the first hunt is not a rut hunt. It's October 5th through the 31st. I we very rarely see any rutting. Um, it's mostly just we're hunting bucks that we found throughout the summer scouting. And um, the second and third choice are rut hunts. And that's 221 to 223. And that's a November, it goes all the way till November 8th. I believe it starts on the, right around the end of October and goes through November 8th, and the other one goes until November 5th in 131 to 134. Those units are, you know, I, they're the two hardest ones to draw. They're both a really good unit for deer in the, you know, to shoot a deer, I would say, between 180 and 200. We've killed a few over 200, but I, some of those hunts are, you know, you're, you have limited time when you've got a six-day window. You're mainly just chasing does and looking at does. And so all your scouting from the summer kind of goes out the window on those units. You're just basically, you know, following does and hoping a big buck shows up. But because it is the rut, we ended up, you know, probably seeing more deer over 180 to 200 in that hunt than any other hunt we do. But a lot of the really big bucks we kill are in the first choice unit because they're bucks we can we have all summer to try to find one, you know, and then we just then it gives us more time to find one. Fourth choice um, is 231. Um, that's one of the top units in the state where we shoot a lot of big bucks on the archery hunts and 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 muzzleloader hunts and on the rifle hunt. The bucks get a little bit tougher; they start to move, um, but it has big bucks in the unit, so you never know. Last year on that unit, we shot. 
probably I think it was a I want to say it was somewhere around a 210 buck, a 196, a 192, and I can't remember what the other buck. We did shoot one other buck. Um, just can't remember what it was. Um, sorry. Um, and then uh, and uh, but that unit. Oh, we shot a 185 buck also in that unit. I remember now. So that unit, I tell guys, it's a 180 to 200 inch type hunt. You know, everyone's well. You'll kill one bigger than that. But, and there's definitely always going to be multiple bucks over 200 in the unit, but it's a tough hunt, you know, during the rifle hunt to kill them in. And then our last choice unit is that 221, 223 early hunt. And, you know, that's the one guys are most likely to draw. Um, it, it ends up being about a 20% draw if you've got any points at all. And on that particular unit, I tell guys it's a 170 to 190 hunt. We probably average over 50% harvest success on 180-plus bucks. Last year on that hunt, we shot a two two fifteen buck, a one ninety one, a one eighty eight, a one eighty, and a one seventy five. Um, and one thing to remember on that is a lot of people are afraid to put in that last choice because they think, ah, oh, it's, it's you know, that people think because it's your your lowest pick, it's not good. You have to remember that's the same unit that three weeks later is the most difficult draw in the state, which is 221 to 223 late. So same unit, you're hunting the same quality of deer, the same age class, you know, the same genetics. It's just not the, not the same dates, you know. It'd be kind of like hunting the strip in October versus if they gave you a chance to hunt it on November 15th, you know. Right. It'd still so be a great hunt. The deer are still harder. there. The bucks are still there. You just might have to dig them out harder. And exactly. They tend to be a little more nocturnal, and it's a tougher hunt, but you still have a chance to kill a giant. Yeah, it's probably just like a, you know, I'd say it's a lot like a coos deer hunt on those, you know, late October hunts versus the rut hunt, you know. Uh, sometimes we actually do better on the air because we can find those bucks, you know, and all the bit, two of the really big bucks we killed in there last year were bucks we found during the summer and bow hunted, didn't kill them, and then we went back and got them on the rifle hunt. So you do have that opportunity on that early hunt to go keep hunting bucks for the first couple of weeks before they start moving. Gotcha. Now, um this outfitter pool, just to be clear and just to be fair to anyone else out there that's listening, this isn't limited to you. You're just an outfitter in Nevada, and yeah. you have your hunters and what and what have you. But there's other outfitters out there that people can call and can uh, go through the same process with, and they put in their hunters, and then it just comes down to who drew what, and you guys go hunting, right? Exactly. It's not something exclusive to me. Every outfitter, anybody that has a master guide's license in Nevada is allowed to apply their non-resident. Anybody that's a non-resident to the state of Nevada can apply with any outfitter. Gotcha. And then we're all competing against the same tags. The one thing that's interesting about Nevada, though, and some of these premium units, you're not talking about a lot of tags compared to a lot of other states, right? And, and isn't that why the quality is pretty darn good as overall the numbers of tags are fairly low compared to some of the others where maybe say like on the Kaibab there might be you know 500 tags on 12A West or something you know it's it's fairly low numbers right yeah it makes it that that's the key is that you know we all complain about because we get frustrated that we, it's hard to get guys drawn but that's the reason the hunt's so good is because it's low numbers Greg how long have you been operating in Nevada I've been in Nevada for probably since 94, so 26 years in Nevada. Wow. Wow. What have you seen since 94? I mean, the progression of mule deer in Nevada. I mean, is it better? Is it worse? You know, different, more numbers, less numbers? Where are we at? You know, I, for sure, I think the numbers are really good still. And it's, that's a t people ask me that all the time, and it's, I don't, you know, you got 26 years ago, I don't feel like I really knew what I was doing 26 years ago. So I feel like, you know, looking back on it now, I'd love to be able to go back there now and hunt it <laughs> today, yeah. uh, you know, because there was very little competition back then, almost no outfitters. Um, and there were a lot of good bucks and we were just kind of learning about 26 years ago, I was still really learning about big bucks, and there were so many things we didn't know about it. So we didn't get as many big bucks back then as we do now, but I think it was probably more because of uh, just experience than anything. Because um, we saw a lot of big bucks back then. We just weren't very good at getting them killed. And so I would say right now, it's 
you know, for sure there's bigger bucks today getting killed than there ever than I've ever seen since I've been going over there in 94. Um, but I don't know if that's because the quality's gotten better or because people have gotten better. There's so many advances and people are putting in so much more time and scouting and whatnot. So I think that's probably a big part of it. Speaking of that, it's kind of a funny question. I get it quite a bit. I just turned 47. I think you're fairly close to me. You might be, what, a year or two older than me or how old are you? Yeah, I'm 51. 51. Um, from your own personal standpoint of, you know, being able to get bucks killed and, you know, your own ability, are you noticing anything with, I mean, I know you've had some accidents. You had a car accident. You had, you know, you were always roping and always doing stuff. But from a physical standpoint or, you know, your eyes, is everything holding up on you pretty well or are you starting to notice, you know, your, your younger guys are spotting deer at three, 400 yards with their naked eye and you're like going, what? I mean, are you noticing anything with your own body that, you know, at 51 that you weren't at, you know, 30? I definitely noticed with my body as far as uh, <laughs> um, th that's definitely starting to, uh, I don't know if I want to say breaking down, that sounds bad, but it's definitely not what it was 20 years ago. As not far quite as, my as, eyes, as would, you were. <laughs> exactly, it's a little bit longer to get up in the morning. Um, <laughs> as far as like my eyes, um, Sorry. Um, as far as my eyes go, I, I got them checked last year. I have 26 vision, so my eyes haven't changed at all as far as that. They've been the same for the last 25 years as far as measuring them. Now, nearsightedness, all my guides give me a hard time because I can't read anything unless it's about two feet from my face. But <laughs> once you get them more than about two feet away from me, then I can, I can see as well You're as deadly. I ever have. It's just, <laughs> it's just the first 20 inches. I can't. They make fun of me because they can read my text messages from 20 yards away, they say, because I have the font so big on it. But um, oh, So, yeah, I don't, notice, awesome. I, don't really, I don't really notice it on my eyes. But as far as physically, um, yeah, I definitely try to follow guys around that have, like Jeff, that, like Jeff Rowe with his five-foot-long legs. That, that, that's definitely yeah. not as easy as it probably would have been 20 years ago. Yeah, you'll get to where you'll probably just ju jump in his backpack and he can take you up to the top of the mountain. <laughs> that guy's unreal. He can just go like crazy. I've, I've heard a lot about him, and I know he's been a big asset to you. I want to dive in just real fast. You talk about kind of having that experience and having that ability to figure out how to kill bucks where you'd love to go back and hunt in you know, the late 90s and, and see what you would do. What, if, you, if you could pinpoint killing these big bucks is it being patient is it a, you know the system of keeping your eyes on a big buck and never never let leaving your eyes off of it you know staying on it leapfrogging you know what is it that you've learned if you had to pinpoint that that helps you guys kill these biggest bucks the biggest thing was just being persistent and trusting that the deer is still there and and then putting in the time early versus late you know um a lot of people do all their scouting right before a hunt, and I think it's way more important to do it early, early. And that's one thing I think helped a bunch last year. Myself and all my guides last year really put in a lot more time than we normally do even. And I feel like we put a lot of time in normally, but we all talked about it, and we just decided last year we were going to put in extra time during the summer and try to locate bucks and then just really try to stay on them and see if we couldn't start getting them killed on those hunts and just work harder at it and that was a big part my guides i mean i've talked to every one of them this year but i was just blown away with how hard they worked as far as the time they put in scouting ahead of time this year and that's the key is 20 years ago we didn't understand that we just kind of you know i would go up there and i would try to i would think doing a good job would be getting there five days before the hunt and scouting for five days where you can get so much more done earlier in the year scouting when they're before they start going nocturnal because they don't really move they just get more nocturnal and obviously it's easier to find them when they're less nocturnal so one day of looking in the summer is as good as five days right before the hunt in my opinion and so, so, so you, you go with the notion days. that if you can find that buck and find where he lives and then once the hunt rolls around or right before the hunt if you can just tell yourself listen i'm going to just stick right in here where this buck is you feel like a lot of guys or your older self back in, you know, when you first started, would have looked for, you know, a couple hours, maybe even a day, and then you're off to something else where maybe now, 26 years of, of experience, you would just stick in there, right in there where that buck is. 
Yeah, I just, I really believe that. And, and here's the thing. Some of them do leave and you're wasting your time, but I don't look at it that way. I look at it as, you know, let's say half of the bucks don't move. That means you've got a 50-50 chance that you're hunting right where there's a giant buck. If you start bouncing around looking for new deer in a place where you don't know there's one, you don't have anywhere close to a 50% chance that you're in, you know, in glassing range of a giant buck. So I look at it, even if they move, you know, sometimes they do, and you just don't kill one on that particular setup. But more than likely they didn't, or more than half the time they don't, and then you do get them killed. And I just think I like playing the percentages, and I just think if you stick it out, you know, this year every big buck that we killed, um, we found some bucks we didn't know about that just showed up, but every one of the target bucks that we found between all my guides that spent all that time this summer, when they found a buck or I found a buck, we killed every one of the bucks that we found that we were trying except for one, and one did just leave, I'm guessing, or we just didn't turn him. It's hard to say. But the other four we killed, and every one of them we killed in the exact place that we had found them. Um, I mean, within a half a mile of where we found them the very first time in the summer. And, and some of them we hadn't seen for 40 days. There was one buck we hadn't seen in 45 days, I think. And then he just showed up again and was in the exact same place. And then we kept, maybe he was there and we just weren't seeing him or maybe he left and came back. But because we just kept going back and going back, we found, and that was the biggest buck we killed last year. And then we finally killed him in the same spot he was all summer. I think that right there is a huge tip that you've given. And you also had the fortune last year, Greg, of drawing a strip tag and you hunted with uh, Clay Bundy, your good friend Clay Bundy, Clay Bundy Outfitters up there in uh, 13B, what a giant buck you shot. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, the dream come true, just the whole thing, getting the chance to hunt with Clay. I, I met Clay, Chad Smith and, and introduced me to Clay on his ranch back in 99, I believe it was. It's a long time ago, 21 years ago. And uh, I got to spend four or five days with Clay up then, back then hunting with a, a friend of ours uh, here locally that had a tag, and Chad was helping him and Clay. And they, back then they were working together. And uh, I just, it's always been a lifelong dream to go up there and hunt the strip with him. And, and uh, he just, he's, and you know Clay, he's a great guy and just a, just a good all-around person. And I would called him after the draw. It was kind of a funny thing. He ended up, one of my really good buddies, Drew, and he called Clay and booked with him and had Clay commit to being the one that was going to guide him. And then he called me back to tell me he had gotten Clay booked and Clay had promised to guide him personally. And then I thought, well, I should check my results, you know. I hadn't even looked yet, and I, I didn't have max points. I had like a 1% chance probably of drawing it, and I pulled up my phone and saw that I had drawn it, and I about had a heart attack. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I told up Clay, and he said, and uh, he started laughing. He's like, you got to be kidding me. You just told me to tell this guy to give him my word that I would personally guide him. And then he goes, and then, uh, you know, and, and now you're calling me. <laughs> so I, I talked Clay into just doing a two-on-one with me and my buddy Jim that had drawn with him. And uh, so we ended up going up there, and I think I got there. The, so um, I think, I believe I got up there about a day before the, maybe two nights, two days before. So we got one day before, and Clay and them had been up there all summer, and he'd done all those governor's tag hunts, and they had so many good bucks located that they knew about. And we weren't even planning on hunting the buck that, that, uh, that I ended up shooting. I'll be honest with you, I didn't even, hadn't even really seen a picture of it, I don't think, until... If I did, it was the night before, I think, just kind of in passing, like, hey, look at this buck on a picture. You know, it wasn't like a target buck. He he looked, he really looked nothing like he does in person on a trail camera picture. Um, there were some other bucks in the area that we were actually hunting, and we found one of them the night before, And um, but unfortunately, a couple of my buddies were already on him, so I got to watch a really big buck and uh, for a long time, and, and they ended up not getting him. And so we were actually in the next morning trying to hunt the other buck, and then this buck showed up and was rutting two does. And uh, it was uh, it was pretty neat. It was, I'm, I'm, I still honestly, it's the biggest. It's my dream buck, and I never in a million years dreamed thought I'd ever kill a deer this big. So well, I mean, it's pretty on excited. the hook. It, it had to look like an absolute horse, man. You know, I didn't. I, it was kind of a funny story. We were. It was, uh, remember, the night before, I probably watched a buck that looked very similar to him. Had a lot of extras, you know, 36 to 38 wide, and 
we, I, I got to watch him and film him for an hour the night before. So that was the buck we were hunting. Well, the next morning when I was sitting there glassing, I, I was with Drummond, my buddy Drummond, and, and we were, there were two does that were about maybe 12 to 1,400 yards away. And it was the first two does I had seen since I'd been there, and Drummond had seen them the night before. So we were looking at them. They didn't have a buck with them. But it was kind of right in the same general area where we'd seen the really big buck the night before. And uh, Jeff was behind me. Uh, Roe had driven in the night before and was helping too. And he was up on a big mountain about two miles away. And, uh, <coughs> and so while we were sitting there watching, these does kind of moved, and they kept coming towards me until they got out of sight behind a little ridge as they were getting closer to me. We could no longer see them, me and Drummond. So we just kept glassing, and, and then Jeff had picked them up and was watching them also, and uh, about maybe 10, 15 minutes after they got out of sight from me and Drummond, uh, Jeff called me up and, <coughs> excuse me, Jeff called me up and told me that uh, the big buck from the night before was rutting those two does. So we already, now we knew right where they were. We didn't have to waste any time trying to figure out where it was, so we just took off. Uh, Drummond and I did and had to maybe go half a mile to get around and get across from them to shoot as we come around we're assuming it's the buck from the night before and uh so we run around and come over the top of this ridge and and uh i start setting up i could see the doe across the drainage and i started setting up and i carry these uh, those phoenix shooting bags you know that have that mm -hmm. bag material type stuff and uh so i was setting up a rest and i could see the dog i only see one of doe i knew there were two and i couldn't see the buck but i knew he was right there somewhere so i set up got a rest got it on the doe i had drumming work on the range finder but we couldn't see it, so I got on. I called Jeff and I asked him if he could still see the buck and where he was. And he said he hadn't seen him in about ten to fifteen minutes, but he was right there somewhere. You know, we just figured he. He was probably four. It was fairly open, but there were four or five, you know, clumps of little junipers, and the, the doe kept looking at it. And we knew he was right there, so we laid there for probably an hour. And I remember at one point asking Jeff if he was sure it was the same buck from the night before, and he said, well, "I'm ninety-nine percent sure." He said, I mean, it's a giant buck regardless, you know, he's really wide and super heavy and he's had a bunch of extras on the right up high and one extra on the left, which is exactly like the buck we were looking for. So I just assumed it was the same buck and I do remember telling Jeff I was going to look and double check and not to worry about it and I'll make sure when he steps out. And right about that time, Jeff tells me the buck stood up. When I look up and I can't see him, then he just, with my naked eye, he stepped out right behind that doe and stepped out in the open. I mean, it's, I'm telling you, yeah, I've never seen anything look like that on the hoof. It it blew me away, and and uh, I just, I mean, I started hyperventilating. It someone standing right behind me, and I've been sitting there for forty five minutes, dry firing on the doe, getting the perfect rest. And I mean, I I'm getting an inch of movement when I'm dry firing on the doe, and I put it on that buck, and he swung his head and lip curled at me, and I. I just, I couldn't, I mean, I'm not exaggerating when I say my crosshairs were going from his pedicles to his hoof <laughs> and then to his tail and all over the place, and I just could not get calm, you know, and I remember Drummond going, man, you know, I take a deep breath, and I turned over and looked at him, and I said, man, he looks bigger today than he did last night, and I had looked at him for an hour the night before, and I said, man, he looks bigger today than he did last night, and then I got back in the gun, and I, I actually told Drummond to not film, because I wanted him to be on the range finder. And, and, uh, so I ended up squeezing off the shot. Funny, it just, everything got him together. It got real calm again. I squeezed out the shot and he dropped. And, uh, it was funny as he's laying there, I jacked another round and I can hear Drummond telling me to stop. And then his head's not even moving anymore. And I, I look at his horns, I'm laying on the ground and I can see his left side and I'm counting the points. I'm thinking, holy cow, this isn't the buck, you know? <laughs> I turned to Drummond and I said, Drummond, this isn't the buck from last night. And, and just, you know, you always have, I mean, I remember looking at him and seeing how huge he looks. I knew it was a big deer, but there's yeah. always that little bit of doubt in the back of your head, you know? Yeah, like, what did we do? Him. Yeah. Yeah, and, I'm, and he's like, I'm like, Drummond, that was a giant deer, right? I wasn't just imagining that, right? And, you know, because if it's the deer you know, then obviously, right. you know what I mean? You, yeah, your you know all systems go, yeah. Yeah, but all of a sudden it's a new one, and then I, as soon as I looked at it, I remembered, I'm like, that's the buck that Clay showed me a picture of. And Clay was right nearby waiting just in case something happened on, like, kind of the, the escape route right over there with my buddy Jim. And so I called Clay on the radio, and I said, Clay, that wasn't the buck. And I'm assuming he heard the shot, but I don't know. Somehow they didn't hear the shot. I don't remember what the reason was, so they were close. 
And uh, he said, well, that's a, I said, this is the buck that you call the Elkhorn buck that you showed me last night. And he said, oh, that's a big buck. I said, someone needs to shoot him. I'll bring Jim over there right now. And I said, no, I already shot him. <laughs> <laughs> and then that worried me because I'm thinking, well, does Clay not think I should have shot this buck? You know? <laughs> and so I called up Jeff, and I'm like, Jeff, this isn't the buck from, from last night. And he's like, oh, man, don't mess with me. And I'm like, I said, no, I mean, it's a big deer, but it's definitely not the buck from last night. And you have to remember, Jeff hadn't seen the buck the night before. He's just kind of going off of a blurry right. picture and a description, you know. And, right. and so we were all a little nervous. Then I walked up to him, and I mean, when I walked up to him on the ground, I, I, could, I just couldn't. I'm never, I'll probably never walk up on another deer like that as long as I live. I've never seen anything that just grew like that the closer we got. But there was that little bit of two or three minutes of, uh, two or three minutes of you start to wonder, you know. Yeah. What did that buck, I mean, what does a buck like that score? I never taped him. Uh, Clay did. I, Clay and Drummond did, I think. And I want to say, God, this is horrible. I don't even know. I want to say he was, uh, I know he's over 35 wide. And I think he was with about, he's got a broken eye guard and one broken cheater. And I think he still scores like 233.7, so roughly Jeez. 234. Jeez. You know, as he is. And then he's got five or six inches broken. I would, I don't know, maybe not that much, maybe four inches broken. I don't know. Super heavy too. Oh, he's just—he's just one of the. I, I, you know, it's funny when when I was talking to Clay throughout the whole thing, and I didn't—we didn't really talk a ton leading up to it because I just—I was having a hard. I was so busy doing stuff in Nevada, and he was busy doing hunts, and I knew I was just going to make it even harder and longer. <laughs> I told him, "Don't even send me pictures. I don't even want to know. It would just make it worse, you know." And and uh, so I know that afterwards. Um, I don't know. I just it, it, it was uh, it was definitely the the buck of my dreams. And I'm, there were other bucks that Clay had a lot of really big bucks found, and he showed me a ton of big bucks when we got there and uh, when we were scouting the day before and looking at different stuff. But in like I said, had I I definitely wouldn't trade this buck for any of the other ones. He just didn't look as good as some of the other ones, if that makes sense. But Clay really knocked it out of the park this year. They all ended up. My buddy Jim shot a really big deer with him, and it was like a. I want to say it was like 204 on their 210 on the frame with four inches of extras and 32 wide, uh, just a giant typical with one small, one or two small extras. And then they killed another 230 bucks. I think they killed another couple of bucks who were right around 230 also. Yeah. So what was, a year. He, he had an unbelievable year. And then they shot some giant bucks with the, the, the auction tags too. So it was definitely the best decision I ever made to go up there. And man, I had a blast hunting with Clay. He's a, He's just a top-notch quality guy. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, I want to give you a chance to let everybody know um, the best way to reach out so they can get in this Nevada guide draw uh, for the rifle mule deer. So why don't you do that? Uh, the best way is you can either email me at uh, gkrog, G-K-R-O-G-H-1, at iCloud dot com or you can um you can just text message me at seven seven five nine six two one seven two one uh or you can dm me through like instagram i can get those direct messages through instagram and then i can uh i can uh just send me your email on any one of those three forms and i'll get back to you right away or you can just call me also and i'll also link this up in the show notes so anybody listening you can just go to the show notes um, Greg, it's always great having you on the podcast. I really appreciate you carving out some time, even though you're sick. Uh, and I look forward to um, seeing how this fall shakes out. It's uh, pretty optimistic, you know, with uh, the moisture we've had and, you know, potentially two good years in a row could be awesome. And um, you always do a great job uh, in Arizona and in Nevada uh, where you guide. So just keep up the good work. You've got a, a great crew working with you. And um, you guys always do a, do a phenomenal job. So I'm um, glad to have your friendship and uh, glad you could spend some time with us. Well, thanks. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. Take care. All right, take care.